to First Minister's questions. <coughs> Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, may I start by offering the thoughts of myself and I'm sure the whole chamber to everyone affected by the horrific events at Grenfell Tower in London yesterday and to offer my thanks to those who responded and those who continue to respond today and to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding officer, we have all been horrified uh, by the tragic events in London this week. I'm sure the thoughts of the whole parliament are with everyone affected and in particular with those who have lost loved ones. I also want to record uh, my gratitude and appreciation to the emergency services who have been responding and who continue to respond. Uh, the investigation into this fire is clearly at a very early stage and while there appear to be very serious questions to be answered, we must be careful not to speculate at this stage. Uh, that said, members will wish to know that the local government minister has this morning discussed the fire with local authority colleagues. Uh, a ministerial group will also be convened to review Scottish regulations and to ensure that we are uh, standing ready to take any actions necessary uh, as lessons are learned from this catastrophic fire. But in the meantime, our thoughts uh, remain with all those affected. Uh, later today, presiding officer, I will have engagements to take forward the government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, presiding officer. Last week, the SNP lost half a million votes and 21 MPs. This after the First Minister had put her plan for a second independence referendum as early as next year at the heart of her campaign. With the benefit of hindsight, does she now think that that was a mistake? First Minister. Well, of course, Presiding Officer, last week the SNP won the election in Scotland. Uh, we, we won more seats than all of the other parties in this chamber put together. And of course, we achieved that result, having been clear in our view that the people of Scotland should have a choice at the end of the Brexit process. However, I have also made clear that I will now reflect on that position, uh, not just in light of how people in Scotland voted, but also in light of what the election UK-wide now means for the Brexit process. And I will set out uh, my views on that once I've had uh, the time to properly consider the interests, not just of my own party, but of Scotland as a whole. But, presiding officer, uh, given the results of the election UK-wide, I think it is a dereliction of duty uh, for Ruth Davidson or any other politician to be focusing only on what might happen at the end of a Brexit process and not on what is about to happen in just four days' time. On Monday, this hapless UK government is about to start a formal negotiation with the EU with no mandate for its hard Brexit position, no consensus even within its own ranks about what it is trying to achieve, let alone in the country more widely. In short, presiding officer, in just four days' time, we are going to be led off the cliff edge by a Tory government devoid of legitimacy and credibility and utterly clueless about what it is trying to achieve. That is the real and present danger to Scottish jobs, investment and living standards. So any politician with a national interest rather than just party interests at heart will be focused on trying, be focused on trying to protect Scotland from a disaster that the Tories are in the process of leading us into, and that is what I am focused on doing. Oh. Ruth Davidson. Nicola Sturgeon talks about Scotland's national interest at heart. Well, Thursday's election was not the only test of public opinion in the last week. Today, fully 60% of people in Scotland say they don't want a second independence referendum, more than double the number who back one. Indeed, even a third of yes voters say they don't want a referendum. So it's a pretty simple question. In light of the election result last week, doesn't the First Minister think she should listen to them? Yeah. Yeah. First Minister. Well, of course, 62% of people in Scotland didn't want the Tory Brexit, but the Tories don't appear to be interested in listening to that. I've already said that I will reflect on all of these factors in dis deciding what, in my view, is the best way forward now, not just for my party or any party within this chamber, but for the country as a whole. That is the right and proper thing to do. But, you know, I don't think anybody in Scotland should be taking any lectures from the Conservative Party. Let's just recap for a moment 
on what the Tories have managed to do to the UK in the space of just one year. Firstly, calling a divisive and unnecessary EU referendum entirely for reasons of Conservative Party management, then having lost that gamble, pursuing a hard Brexit path purely to appease the right wing of the Conservative Party. And as if that wasn't enough, then calling an unnecessary general election purely in the self-interest of the Conservative Party and having mucked up that campaign, they are now putting the country in hawk to the DUP. That's what the Tories have done in the space of less than a year. Jeopardised the economic security of the UK, running the risk of making the UK a laughing stock internationally. And as if that wasn't bad enough, putting the Irish peace process at risk into the bargain. What a shower of charlatans the Tories are, and nobody should take any lessons from them. Ruth Davidson. It's the same every single time. Ask her for a referendum plan and she hides behind her Brexit bogeyman. Every single time. But let's hear what the message is. The message has been from this First Minister on the referendum plan. It's hunker down. It's attack anyone who asks for a little bit of clarity and hope that none of us notice that they're pressing on regardless. Well, we all remember. We all remember what happened after the Brexit vote last summer. Within hours of the result, hours of it, the First Minister pounced to put a second independence referendum on the table. Yet this week, when independence is under threat, she suddenly insists it must be wrong to take a, a knee-jerk decision. Total double standards. Yeah. Presiding officer, some of our colleagues, some of our colleagues, Harder. some of our colleagues like Alec Neil understand it. He says that we should recognise that Indy Ref 2 is not going to happen in the lifetime of this Scottish Parliament session. And if he gets the public mood, why can't she? Yeah. First Minister. What people deserve from me and are going to get from me over the next few days is some calm uh, reflection. But let me say, I think what Ruth Davidson has just demonstrated there today and what she is increasingly demonstrating to the Scottish people is that she is nothing more than a one-trick pony. Yeah. Having to confront any issue other than an independence referendum, she is left floundering. Now, Ruth Davidson has asked for clarity. Isn't it, isn't it the case that people in Scotland have a right to expect some clarity from the Conservatives about what is due to happen, not in some months' time, but in four days' time. So perhaps Ruth Davidson, the next time she gets to her feet, will give us some clarity around these issues. Is Ruth Davidson's position today that we should be in the single market or out of the single market? Is her position that we should be in the customs union or out of the customs union? Or is her position exactly what her position has been over the past year, that she will do exactly what Theresa May tells her to do, regardless of what is in the best interest of the country. So I will give Ruth Davidson a chance to prove that she has any ability to think independently on these matters, in and out of the single market, in and out of the customs union. Why don't we get some clarity on a negotiation that's about to start in four days' time? I make no apologies for raising her referendum threat today because given she won't talk to well Order. given that she won't even talk to her own cabinet about it, I thought they might like to hear what your plan actually is. So first of all, the First Minister talks about decisions made in the best interest of Scotland. But doesn't she realise that is precisely what we did in 2014? The majority of people in Scotland believe that staying in the UK is in the best interest of Scotland. So let's cut to the chase today. This, this has got nothing to do with listening to the people. It's all about how she can find a way to reflow or rebrand her sinking dream of independence. And the people of Scotland just want to put it behind us. We just want to put it behind us. And she says she's listening to the folk of Scotland, and so she should. Her referendum isn't wanted, so will she ditch it now? Yeah. First Minister. Tell us. Well, everybody watching this will notice that Ruth Davidson completely dodged all of the issues about what is confronting this country in four days' time. 
So from me, people will get the calm reflection in the national interest that I have promised. But I say this again, presiding officer, this country in four days' time is facing the prospect of being taken off a cliff edge by a Tory government in Westminster that does not have a clue what it is doing. That is completely unacceptable. And I think what people in Scotland want to know from Ruth Davidson is what is her position on these vital issues? Because Scottish jobs depend on it. Scottish investment depends on it. Scottish living standards depend on it. So I'll continue to stand up for Scotland and Scottish interests on Brexit and on every other matter. While the Tories simply do whatever they are told to do by their bosses in London. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. Can I add the heartfelt condolences of these benches to everyone affected by the events at Grenfell Tower? Once again, we find ourselves in awe of the heroics of the emergency services. I think we all looked on with horror, anger and dismay and share a collective desire to make sure that everything that can be done is being done to prevent future tragedies uh, like this. And in that spirit, I strongly urge the First Minister to listen to the concerns of the Fire Brigade's union. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week? First Minister. Uh, engagement to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. In last week's election, voters sent the First Minister a clear message to focus on what really matters to people. The First Minister still pretends that education has always been her top priority. But we all know that her Government has presided over 4,000 fewer teachers whilst class sizes are up. Scotland is falling down international league tables and parents are being asked to fill in in the classroom. And while she has taken her eye off the ball, we've had college lecturers on strike and now even teachers are threatening industrial action. The First Minister can't blame negative media coverage for this. Why is it always someone else's fault and never hers? First Minister. Well, I have to say, on, on that, with the greatest respect, Kezia Dugdale is talking uh, nonsense. This government as will be demonstrated when the Deputy First Minister outlines to Parliament this afternoon the next stage in our education reform programme, uh, we take full responsibility for making sure that we equip our education system to raise standards and close the attainment gap. That's why we have in place the new National Improvement Framework. That's why we have in place the new attainment fund, uh, including the Pupil Equity Fund that has put £120 million directly into the hands of head teachers. Uh, this afternoon, uh, the Deputy First Minister will outline the outcome of the governance review, which will uh, include steps to make sure that we have a, a school system that puts schools teachers, head teachers and pupils absolutely at the centre of the system. Uh, Kezia Dugdale has raised the important issue also uh, of uh, the recent college dispute and that gives me the opportunity to set out uh, my clear expectations on that. A agreement was reached on the 19th of May that allowed the strike to be called off and that was extremely welcome. Uh, discussions have continued since then around some outstanding issues. However, I am very clear that what was agreed on the 19th of May now needs to be fully implemented. Uh, I spoke to the chair of the Employers Association yesterday. The Employers Association will meet again uh, on Monday and be asked to ratify the agreement already reached, including payment of the first instalment of the cash settlement. And I uh, hope and expect that that ratification will take place uh, on Monday uh, and that any further prospect of strike action is removed completely. See, the problem for the First Minister is that this week the EIS union revealed what teachers really think about Scotland's education system. Their workload has increased and fewer than half would recommend teaching as a career. There is a recruitment crisis with hundreds of vacancies, some of which will take up to three years to fill. And new figures reveal that teachers are receiving up to six £1,000 less than they should if their pay had risen in line with inflation. It is little wonder that teachers are saying enough is enough. What will the First Minister say to teachers who are struggling in our schools? And can I suggest that sorry might be a good place to start? First Minister. Well, what we will continue to do is uh, what we are doing, investing with local authorities to make sure that we maintain teacher numbers, putting more resources into the hands of head teachers to equip them 
uh, to better respond to challenges they face in the schools. The Deputy First Minister will continue to work uh, to take the action to reduce unnecessary workload uh, on the part of teachers. That's why the SQA and Education Scotland are already uh, reducing and clarifying the guidance they provide uh, to teachers. Education Scotland has already published clear advice for teachers uh, and on what they should and shouldn't be expected to do in the classroom. Definitive benchmark guidance on literacy and numeracy has already uh, been published. In fact, benchmarks for all the curriculum areas have now been uh, published, uh, replacing a much larger volume of existing material. So we will continue to get on uh, with responding to the challenges uh, that we do face uh, by taking the action that we are taking. That's what responsible governments are expected to do, and that is what this government will continue to do. I think that response from the SNP backbenches says it all. <laughs> because <laughs> never Never has the First Minister sounded so out of touch with the reality on the ground. And the truth is, the First Minister has taken teachers for granted for years. And now they are threatening strike action just to get John Swinney to sit up and pay attention. Because, of course, the SNP's answer to this crisis is to send untrained teachers into our classrooms to introduce league tables and high-stakes testing into primary schools. And she has even flirted with opt-out schools. Each and every one a failed Tory policy. Doesn't this just prove, First Minister, that if you vote SNP, you get Tory? First Minister. who actually advised some people in Scotland to vote Tory. That's a bit rich. And no wonder Kezia Dugdale is blushing right now. But let's get back to the serious matters. Firstly, you know, it's simply not sufficient for Kezia Dugdale just to come here and make it up as she goes along. There is no question whatsoever of untrained teachers uh, being in schools in Scotland uh, and John Swinney will set out uh, the position of the government on all aspects of the governance review later this afternoon uh, but we will continue to get on with the job of reforming and investing in Scottish education extra money to help teachers with the job that they do the reforms that are necessary to ensure improvements in our schools and also to ensure that politicians uh, are held much more to account because of the greater transparency we're introducing into the system and what is striking again today uh, as it has been so often in the past in this chamber is that whenever we come forward uh, with policies and ideas and initiatives to address these challenges, all Labour does is oppose them. They never bring forward any constructive ideas of their own, which is probably why, presiding officer, for the first election, uh, general Westminster election, in living memory, Labour came third. That's the reality of Labour in Scotland today as the SNP continues to get on with the job. A couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Bob Doris. Uh, President officer, I extend my sympathies to everyone impacted by the horrific and deeply shocking events of the Grenfell Tower fire tragedy. First Minister, my constituency of Maryhill and Springburn has several high-rise tower blocks. There will be many MSPs in this chamber with similar stock right across their constituency. I also know my local housing association will place a significant priority on safety, including fire safety. But that will not stop those living in such properties having understandable concerns. Whilst I welcome the steps already taken by the First Minister outlined today, does the First Minister agree with me that we must ensure the most appropriate and rigorous fire safety regulations possible are in place, that we reassure worried householders, but that we must also ensure that whatever lessons must be learned from the Grenfell tragedy in the weeks and months ahead, that they are also learned and acted upon here in Scotland? First Minister. I agree uh, very much with Bob Doris. Uh, I know that many members across the chamber, perhaps in particular uh, members like Bob Doris and myself, in fact, who represent urban constituencies with high rise uh, flats uh, within them, uh, will feel particularly concerned uh, at the tragic events we've seen in London this week. As I said earlier on, 
Uh, while I think there are the most serious questions to be answered uh, in the case of this uh, tragic fire, uh, given how early uh, a stage the investigation is at, it is important that we don't rush to judgment or early speculation about the causes uh, of that fire. But nevertheless, we must be, and I'm acutely uh, aware of the responsibility the Scottish Government bears here, we must stand ready to provide whatever reassurance we can to people across Scotland uh, who are living in similar accommodation and who may have uh, very understandable concerns as a result of what we've seen this week, but also that we are standing ready to learn any lessons that require to be learned as the causes of this fire uh, become clearer. That's why the local government minister had those early discussions with local authority uh, partners this morning. We will also discuss uh, these matters, in, uh, particularly around fire safety and regulation uh, with the Scottish Fire uh, Service and uh, the ministerial group that I refer to will be convened to make sure that on a, an ongoing basis and in as close to real time as possible, uh, we are uh, learning any lessons that have to be learned and taking whatever steps in Scotland require to be taken. Uh, any member uh, who has a constituency interest in this, I know all members uh, have a very human interest in this, but any member who has a particular constituency interest in in this, uh, we would be happy to keep uh, very closely updated on any steps the Scottish Government consider uh, are appropriate. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, yesterday, a Press and Journal report revealed that an Aberdeen man had died following a 999 call handler error last month. Information regarding the call had not been passed to the dispatch team, and by the time the error was realised and an ambulance dispatched, 33 minutes had passed. Tragically, the man had passed away. What action reported about this uh, tragic case and first and foremost uh, my heartfelt sympathies are uh, with the family and friends of the individual who has sadly passed away. Um, this uh, case is under investigation by the Scottish Ambulance Service. The Health Secretary has already uh, spoken to the Chief Executive of the Scottish Ambulance Service to seek and get assurances that there will be a full uh, and proper investigation. Given that that investigation is underway, it would uh, not be appropriate for me to go into any more detail or speculate uh, on the outcome of that, but uh, the Health Secretary would be happy to correspond uh, further with the member when we have more detail as a result of the investigation that is currently underway. And Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the energy regulator off chairman SSE uh, have announced this week the closure of the Lerwick Power Station with a loss of 25 permanent jobs and apprenticeships. Uh, they are to replace the power station with a cable importing wind from Caithness, but will not allow, that cable will not allow large-scale renewables to be exported from Shetland. Will the First Minister ask off uh, to consider how such an ill-conceived proposal has seen the light of day? First Minister. I'm very happy to ask the relevant minister to discuss this further with Ofgem. I mean, we are aware of the uh, proposed new energy solution uh, for Shetland, which would seek to connect Shetland to the Scottish mainland for the first time, uh, while also having some uh, diesel uh, supply on island. Uh, while you know, there are aspects of that, of course, that uh, contribute to uh, our uh, approach to cleaner energy, there are also understandable concerns uh, about security of supply and also the issues around export uh, that Tavish Scott uh, has referred to. Now, this is something that, of course, uh, has been brought forward by uh, the uh, Scottish and Southern Electricity uh, Networks uh, and also has uh, been overseen by Ofgem, which is an independent regulator. But I recognise uh, the concerns that Tavish Scott is expressing uh, on behalf of his constituents. I will ask the uh, relevant minister to speak uh, with Ofgem to make sure that those concerns are conveyed and then to have further discussions with Tavish Scott as a result of that. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I add my concern and that of my party uh, for those affected by the shocking events at Grenfell Tower uh, and our concern for those already suffering, uh, grieving uh, or worrying still about friends and relatives and fearing the worst. Uh, and may I ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will next meet on Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Two uh, weeks ago, the government's consultation on fracking and unconventional gas was closed. It's been reported that there are tens of thousands of responses, and the First Minister may already be in a position to confirm whether this is one of the biggest public responses to a government consultation ever. And since it closed, even more concerns have been raised on the health impacts of fracking with uh, reports of over 150 studies linking the chemicals used in the fracking industry to cancer risk, to permanent lung, lung damage, for example, by exposing workers 
to benzene and silica dust, amongst other substances. And these concerns extend to the wider public health fears as well. The temporary moratorium, which has been in place for a year and a half and which we know cannot last for the long term, uh, the government knows that it's going to have to make a decision. They've previously given a commitment that a final decision on a full ban will be made by the end of this calendar year. Now that the consultation is closed, can I ask the First Minister to confirm that timetable time and give a clear commitment that the decision will be made and a vote brought to Parliament before the end of this year? First Minister. Uh, that is the timetable we continue uh, to work to and uh, let me also uh, restate our commitment to bringing a vote to Parliament. We said that uh, when we launched the consultation and nothing uh, has changed about that. Um, Patrick Harvey asked me specifically about the scale of uh, the consultation responses. Uh, I think it's uh, important to say that final numbers are still being uh, confirmed uh, through the validation and verification process, but in the region of 60,000 uh, responses have been uh, received. A considerable number of those responses have been via uh, postcard and petition campaigns, but it is important, and I am sure Patrick Harvey will agree with this, it is important that we now properly analyse uh, those consultation responses uh, and uh, use that uh, as uh, the factor that we will take into account when reaching a final decision. Uh, Patrick Harvey is, is right, there is uh, absolutely no uh, doubt about that, that a moratorium by its very nature is, is temporary and we will have always said that that moratorium is in place um, pending a final decision on the substantive issue. Um, I think it's important also to recognise that the reason we have taken this very cautious and precautionary approach is exactly because of those concerns uh, that Patrick Harvey has outlined. There are many people with a range of different concerns about fracking, uh, from environmental to health to transport uh, concerns. Uh, none of those concerns could or should ever have been brushed aside. So that's why we're taking uh, this approach uh, and will continue uh, to do that and take into account all of these views uh, and concerns. And the final point I would make um, is to reassure people that while this process is underway, that moratorium does remain in place. And what that means is no fracking or uh, drilling for coal bed uh, methane can take place in Scotland uh, until the outcome of this process. Patrick Harvey. I'm pleased that the extraordinary number of responses will demonstrate the breadth of concern about this issue. And I'm pleased also that that number of responses will not be used as an excuse to delay the process. Of course, there needs to be analysis of those responses, but we do need clarity. And every one of those 60,000 people deserves clarity that the decision will be made this year. And there will be widespread expectation that that decision will be for a full and permanent ban on these techniques. The SNP's 2016 manifesto said, we will not allow fracking or underground coal gasification in Scotland unless it can be proved beyond any doubt that it will not harm our environment, communities, or public health. And since the publication of that document, we still see SNP activists campaigning wearing frack off badges, and we hear SNP politicians saying things like, it's time to bring to an end the Tory days of gung-ho fracking policies in Scotland, or jobs, water quality, food and drink would all be unnecessarily put at risk. Comments which clearly are incompatible with a positive decision to give the green light to these techniques. Does the First Minister also agree that if, fracking, that, that if Brexit, in fact, goes ahead as the UK government plans, it will mean that a huge number of the environmental controls and protections which will affect this industry and many others which threaten public health in Scotland will be decided here? Can we seek a clear and absolute guarantee that not one of those regulations will be downgraded, watered down or weakened in Scotland? First Minister. Well, uh, to take the latter part of Patrick Harvey's question first, I, I think even uh, our harshest critic would uh, suggest that the concern about the watering down of environmental regulations post-Brexit is not a concern uh, that people should have about this government. It is certainly a concern that people should have about the current UK government. We take environmental protection and regulation very, very seriously. Uh, indeed, one of uh, my many concerns about the Brexit process uh, is the fact that we will see a fragmentation of that environmental protection uh, 
uh, through the process of the UK leaving uh, the EU. Uh, back to the issue of, of, of fracking, I would have thought Patrick Harvey uh, would have welcomed the fact that uh, he is able to quote so many uh, members of the SNP uh, agreeing with his position. Um, I have described myself previously and would continue to do so as somebody who is personally very sceptical uh, about fracking for many of the reasons that Patrick Harvey has outlined. What we said in our manifesto around this absolutely stands and that is the standard uh, by which we will assess this issue. But we have embarked on a process of consultation which of course follows uh, the process of expert research uh, work that we did into a range of these issues and it is vital that we conclude that uh, include conclude that with all due process and in good faith. Uh, so we will do that. We will do that in the timescale that we set out and come to uh, a final decision in that timescale. Uh, and lastly, uh, again, as I said in my first answer, people in Scotland can be assured that pending the outcome of this process, there will be no fracking uh, in Scotland. That's why the moratorium at the moment is so important. Further supplementary from Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Roaming charges within the EU have been abolished from today, meaning that we don't get billed excessive amounts for making calls and sending text messages abroad. Has the Scottish Government had any assurances from the UK Government that they'll work to preserve this benefit in Brexit negotiations? First Minister. Uh, we've had, to the best of my knowledge, absolutely no assurances from the UK Government on what is a very important issue for uh, people who use mobile phones uh, in other European countries. Uh, there's no doubt that the abolition of roaming charges is one of uh, many benefits arising from the digital single market and I think it's vitally important that Scottish consumers continue to benefit from this uh, post-Brexit. Uh, in spite of uh, continued lack of meaningful engagement on the part of the UK Government on any of these matters, the Scottish Government will continue to engage in good faith to ensure that our interests are represented as these negotiations get underway, uh, as I would remind uh, the Chamber in just four days' time. Question number four, James Dornan. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to support LGBT rights. First Minister. I'm very proud of this Government's record on LGBTI rights, uh, including, of course, the introduction of civil partnerships uh, and now equal marriage for same-sex couples. Uh, we have uh, robust and inclusive hate crime legislation in place. We've established the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group, uh, and we also intend to reform gender recognition law. Uh, these actions are why Scotland continues to be ranked as one of the most progressive countries in Europe regarding LGBTI equality. Of course, it's not just the actions we take for those living in Scotland that are important, but also our willingness to stand up for LGBTI rights across the world, something that this government is determined to continue to do. James Dornan. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The First Minister will be aware that the LGBTI Pride celebrations are happening across Scotland this month and in Belfast next month. At the same time, the Tories, in a desperate attempt to cling on to power at Westminster, will be dealing with the DUP, who have used their veto to block legalising same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland a total of five times. Does the First Minister share my concerns about the message this arrangement sends out to members of the LGBTI community, along with many others, and does she agree with me that this just highlights the importance of complete transparency with any proposed Tory deal with the DUP before it is signed and sealed? First Minister. Um, let, me make, let me make a number of points. The first one, uh, before I make it, let me recognise up front that the issue of same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland is one to be decided by politicians in Northern Ireland. It's not one uh, for decision uh, in this Parliament. Uh, but I do think it is regrettable uh, that Northern Ireland is now the only part of the UK where loving same-sex couples cannot get married as they can in uh, England, Wales uh, and Scotland. And I certainly would hope that we see that change uh, for the better in the not-too-distant future. Um, second point I would make is to uh, record uh, my deep seated concern and I believe the deep seated concern of many not just in Scotland but across the UK right now at the prospect of some kind of grubby deal between the Tories and the DUP to allow Theresa May to cling to office. Uh, you know I've just uh, listened to Ruth Davidson talking uh, about the national interest. I don't think that kind of deal particularly if it's not completely and utterly transparent is in the national interest in any uh, way, shape or form. And I say that not just because uh, of some of the views of the DUP that perhaps not all of us, but many of us feel deeply uncomfortable uh, about, but I also say that because of a real concern 
about the disregard that is being shown for the Northern Irish peace process. Uh, I think one of the most shameful aspects of the whole Brexit process from the beginning to now has been the disregard shown by many for that peace process. Uh, under the Good Friday Agreement, the UK Government is meant to be an impartial uh, broker in Northern Ireland. And I think there is First a Minister, real this question is about LGBT uh, rights, please. raised by uh, John Major and others uh, about whether that can be the case. So I think these matters are serious. Uh, I've seen this morning some suggestion that the deal, if there is a deal between the Tories and the DUP, will not be published in full. I think that would be completely unacceptable. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Excuse me. First Minister, in September of uh, 2015, the Scottish Government uh, received a letter from Arlene Fraser, the present leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, then in her capacity as a, a Government Minister, and it was about Scotland's equal marriage legislation. My colleague, uh, um, Claire Bailey, Green MLA for South Belfast, describes this as part of Ms Foster's anti-equality offensive. Rather than hide behind freedom of information, will you publish that letter? First Minister. Uh, well, I'm happy to give consideration to that. Uh, my understanding is that that letter was about civil, uh, the, the translation of civil partnerships into uh, marriages here. So I'm, I'm certainly happy to uh, consider that. The, the commitment of this government, and I, you know, I believe something we should celebrate, is that this is a commitment shared across this parliament to equality is beyond uh, any question. Now, we are responsible for our own actions in this regard, but on issues like equality, whether it's LGBTI equality or any other aspect of equality, the importance not just of doing the right thing at home, but standing up for the right thing uh, in other countries and the world over is also important, and that's a responsibility I'm very aware of. Question five, Peter Chapman. And thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Audit Scotland update on the CAP Futures programme. First Minister. One of these days I'm going to ask Peter Chapman to tell me which particular page of his register of interest he's, he's referring to on these matters. Um, over, over the past year we have made significant changes to the development and implementation of the CAP Futures programme. Uh, clearly, there is a lot more for us to do, but I welcome that this update report from Audit Scotland recognises some of the progress we've made and reinforces the actions we've taken since last May. Uh, we will now consider carefully the findings in the context of the significant improvement activity that is already underway. Peter Chapman. I am grateful to the First Minister for that answer. I have to say I am absolutely shocked at how complacent the First Minister is here. Yeah. 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 Because, because, let me be clear, farming communities are not so relaxed about these issues as she is. Mm -hmm. This IT system has already created the worst farming cash crisis in a generation. Correct. Now we learn there is still no backup system. Should this IT system fail, there is the possibility of a 60 million in EU fines for non-compliance, and yet more money is needed to get the system working. Farmers across Scotland are still waiting for 2015 and 2016 payments. And worst of all, worst of all, we face at least another year of this chaos until this system is fully compliant. In light of this catalogue of errors, does the First Minister take responsibility for this catastrophe? And how can our farmers ever trust her again? First Minister. Well, as I've, as I've said in this chamber before, I take full responsibility for everything this government uh, does. There is not a shred of complacency on the part of the Scottish Government about this uh, issue. Fergus Ewing has uh, already apologised. I've apologised to farmers uh, for the failures that have been experienced in this system. But that is why a significant part of uh, the time and energy of Fergus Ewing each and every day right now is taken up with ensuring that this system uh, delivers as farmers have a right to expect it to do. Um, obviously, the member has made uh, a number of, of comments there that, you know, do require to be uh, challenged. I mean, Fergus Ewing, just before First Minister's questions uh, started, uh, challenged some of them. This issue about uh, disallowance uh, risks, uh, the figure of 60 million is entirely speculative, uh, just as the figure of 125 million, which was quoted in last year's Audit Scotland report, was also entirely speculative and turned out not to be the case. In terms of the uh, issue about the budget, the financial ceiling uh, for delivering a compliant uh, cap system is being held to. And in terms of payments to farmers, it's because we are acutely aware of the importance of cash flow 
for farmers that we put in place the loan uh, scheme, making sure that farmers uh, got their payments. And of course, as Fergus Ewing already uh, said uh, this morning, 99% of payments in terms of the 2015 round uh, have been made and we are continuing to work through uh, the 2016 payments. So we will continue to give this our absolute uh, and full focus and attention to make sure that farmers get the service they deserve. Mike Rumbles. On the 31st of May last year, Fergus Ewing, in his first appearance in the chamber after his appointment, said, and I quote, the farming industry needs to have confidence in the payment timetable and that we will do what we say. There must be no repeat of the problems that we faced in 2015-16. No repeat. Does the First Minister have confidence that he has fulfilled that promise? First uh, yes, that is entirely what Fergus Ewing is focused on doing. That's why we've got the loan scheme in place. That's why we are taking the steps to make sure farmers get the money uh, that they are expecting while we take the steps that many of which are narrated in the Audit Scotland report today to make sure the IT system is doing the job that it is there to do uh, while we continue to pay attention to the overall budget and the value for money issues at the heart of this. So we will continue, led by Fergus Ewing, uh, to focus absolutely on making sure uh, that we deliver in the way that farmers across the country uh, have the right to expect. Question number six, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the First Minister whether work by Scottish Government officials on a second independence referendum will now cease. First Minister. Uh, well, in case I didn't mention it earlier on, uh, last week the SNP won the general election in Scotland with more MPs than all other parties combined. But as I have already said, uh, I will reflect carefully on the election result before uh, setting out my views on the next steps. What is clear? is that the people of the UK have rejected a hard Tory Brexit and it's imperative that we now build a cross-party, four-government approach that will protect all of our interests at this time. Lewis MacDonald. She lost a heap of seats. Her flagship policy cost her votes. Yet she seemed to think that she'd won the election. Order. That was... Order, please. That was Theresa May last week. <laughs> but Nicola Sturgeon this week seems to be equally in denial. Given that the First Minister has said that she wants to be involved in negotiating Brexit on behalf of the UK, will she not now recognise that she cannot possibly be sitting at the top table and heading for the exit at one and the same time. First Minister. Well, look, I've, I've made my position clear on the reflection I will now give to the issue of an independence referendum. But on this issue of Scotland being represented in these negotiations, whatever our disagreements and other matters might be, I would have thought that every MSP across this chamber of all parties would agree that Scotland should be represented in these negotiations. It really is. It really does speak volumes. You know, I would expect it from the Tories. The Tories want Scotland's position to just be to keep quiet and do whatever the Tories tell us to do. But I am astounded that not just Labour, but Lewis MacDonald in particular, who has actually been very sensible on these matters over the past year, is not getting behind the Scottish Government and demanding that Scotland, Wales and both sides in Northern Ireland are fully engaged in these negotiations. Anything else would be completely unacceptable and I couldn't believe that Labour would ever go along with it. Question number seven, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Carers Week. First Minister. Well, firstly, I want to thank carers uh, for all that they do. The Scottish Government continues to support Carers Week, which encourages all of us to better understand the challenging circumstances that unpaid carers across Scotland can face. Uh, Aileen Campbell and uh, Jamie Hepburn yesterday visited Life Care in Edinburgh to recognise the work of carer positive employers, employers who support unpaid carers in their workplace. Our week-long benefit take-up campaign is also running this week in partnership with Young Scott to increase awareness and uptake of carers' allowance amongst young adults with caring responsibilities. Graham Day. Uh, I very much welcome the actions just highlighted, but I wonder if the FM could uh, outline what further measures and support will be provided to unpaid carers in coming years. First Minister. 
Well, the Carers Act uh, will extend and enhance the rights of carers to support uh, from next April, uh, and that will help them to continue to care if they so wish, but also to maintain a fulfilling life alongside caring. Uh, we will also increase carers' allowance to the same level as job seekers' allowance from summer 2018, and we're committed to increasing carers' allowance further for those looking after more than one disabled child. Uh, we'll also continue to promote the Carer Positive Scheme to employers, uh, linking with our Fair Work agenda. Uh, 72 organisations have so far been recognised as Carer Positive employers, uh, which covers just short of 300,000 employees. Uh, that helps carers balance caring and employment responsibilities, but also helps employers retain valuable staff. So across a whole range of issues, we are absolutely determined to do everything we can to support carers in the invaluable work that they do. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business in the name of Christine Graham. And just take a few moments for members to change seats.